proceeding from heaven and earth, emerging in the spirit like one never heard.
Good morning, Life Church. We're coming to you from Cape Town and also our churches, Pretoria and Zimbabwe Life Churches, are joining this morning to be with us. And then, of course, you who have joined globally. We love having you with us this morning. We've launched our 21 day prayer on our app, and we would love you to connect with that and pray and believe with us to see God change the situation. Um, we also want to tell you that our soul groups are meeting virtually, and you can do that via Zoom. You can also do it in a WhatsApp, or you can telephone each other and encourage each other. It's so important that we keep connecting. And we keep talking during this time of lockdown. If you want to know more and you want to join a virtual cell group, then you can go to info at life-church.co.za. So if you want to go to our church app, then you need to go to Life Church Africa. And on there, you can get to see our daily devotions. You can see our weekly blog. And these are messages that leaders have put together to encourage you with. And then, of course, Kids Life. We have some resources. So, parents, you can go and check online on the app and get uh, a download so that you can encourage your children at this time while they're at home with you. And we'll also be doing a newsletter because we want you to remain connected with our community. And we'd love to tell you and share with you what is going on so that we can show you how you can be of help as well. And if you want to be part of that, you can also go to info at life-church.co.za. Um, just an update on Life Academy. At this time, uh, we will continue to run, and this will be virtual. So again, that's also part on our app. You can go to our app and get that information and you can join the Life Academy. And we'd also like to remind you about Easter. This is such a special time for the family of God, and it will be happening on Friday at 10 o'clock, where we'll be sharing communion together, and this will be happening online. And again, at 9 and 11 on Sunday, you can join together and gather with us as the family of God. I just want to encourage you at this time that you are incredible citizens, you are staying at home, and you are saving lives. And for that, we are incredibly grateful to you. So continue to be responsible. Um, know that we are praying for you. And right now, we're going to join together and enter a time of worship where we're going to give Jesus all the glory. Amen. That the future is brighter. I believe in His promise for me. I believe that He's working and He's not done. The best, the best is yet to come. I know He makes the anxious courageous. I know He makes the doubters believe. I know He won't stop working because He's not done. The best.
What an appropriate song for the season that we're in right now, believing that God is our way maker, our miracle maker. And I truly believe that this is a song for our season right now and that a lot of things are out of our control, but we know that our God is in control and we know that he, amongst all the other things that are going on, he's our, he's our way maker and he can do anything. And all we need to do is to cry out to him and, and believe in his promises and pay attention to his word and so I want to pray with us today before we get started, just to pray into COVID-19 and pray into this lockdown. Let's pray for ourselves, but let's also pray for those that aren't in a position like we are in. Let's pray for the less fortunate. Let's pray for the sick. Let's pray for the elderly and the vulnerable. So come on, let's join together in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for today. I thank you that today we get to celebrate you. We get to celebrate your goodness. We get to celebrate your faithfulness. We get to celebrate our trust and our provision from you, Father God. And I just want to pray for every single person that is watching right now, Father God, those that are low in faith, those that are struggling with their mental situation, those that are struggling with not being able to control the future. God, would you bring them peace and would you bring them calmness in the midst of this? Would you truly Bring them calmness in the midst of the storm, Father God. And I just pray for those that are in our townships, and I pray for those that don't necessarily have all the food and have all the provisions that are needed for this period of lockdown. Father God, would you provide for them miraculously, Father God. Father God, would you comfort them? God, in their tears, would you bring them joy? Father God, and would you provide their every health need and medical need in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. It's so important to pray during this time. Uh, because prayer brings us closer and brings us into a better intimacy with God. And I want to encourage you to keep on praying and keep on drawing near to God during this time. And what an appropriate theme I really do believe, because I believe that in the midst of us being locked down, God can do the greatest move He's ever done um, in the midst of this, in the midst of social distancing or physical distancing. I believe that God's Spirit is going to move in greater ways than what we've seen in this generation. And today we're talking about expanding the kingdom. And we've been walking through the parables of how Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to be talking about the wedding feast today. You know, some of us might not have had breakfast. Uh, I want to encourage you, maybe put this on pause and go, go grab some tea or grab some coffee and eat while we're having a feast together. Because this is going to be a message that is going to change our perspective and change what it means to be community and what it means to be invited and what it means to be embraced and what it means to be accepted. So we're going to be digging into the wedding feast. And if you think about the Jewish culture and what it meant to have a wedding feast back in biblical times, for a kingdom, for a king, the wedding feast, the wedding banquet was one of the most important events in the times of royalty in, in the royal period. And it spoke about new responsibility. It spoke about succession. It spoke about multiplication because marriage means babies, right? Um, it, it speaks about strengthening and alliances. And it speaks about celebration. And it speaks about honor. No corners are cut in this time. Every detail is elaborate from the curtains to the chairs to what's covering the tables to the food. Everything is lavish in design. There's no shortage of supply and every seat would be occupied. The people in attendance would be invited, not from just the city, but from far and wide. The existing alliances and the hopeful alliances, every invitation would not be, would, wouldn't be spared. Invites were sent out in every single direction and actually not attending would be an insult. And really what it was about was about honoring the king and celebrating the couple. 
So Jesus paints this incredible picture of what it means to be in the midst of a wedding feast. And he correlates it to the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew and Luke, they begin to bring a perspective into this. So I want to dig into Matthew. I want to dig into Luke right now because it comes from different angles. So let's go to Matthew 22, verse 1 to 14. And it says this. It says, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves. I need you to lock into that, that word. He sent his slaves to summon those who had been invited to the banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, the feast I have prepared for you is ready. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they were indifferent and went away. One to his farm, another to his business. The rest seized his slaves, insolently mistreated them and killed them. The king was furious. He sent his soldiers and they put those murderers to death and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but the ones who had been invited were not worthy. So go into the main streets and invite everyone, uh, everyone you encounter to the wedding banquet. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the wedding guests, he saw a man there. What an appropriate song for the season that we're in right now, believing that God is our way maker, our miracle maker. And I truly believe that this is a song for our season right now and that a lot of things are out of our control, but we know that our God is in control and we know that he, amongst all the other things that are going on, He's our, he our way maker and He can do anything. And all we need to do is to cry out to Him and, and believe in His promises and pay attention to His word. And so I want to pray with us today before we get started, just to pray into COVID-19 and praying to this lockdown. Let's pray for ourselves, but let's also pray for those that aren't in a position like we are in. Let's pray for the less fortunate. Let's pray for the sick. Let's pray for the elderly and the vulnerable. So come on, let's join together in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for today. I thank you that today we get to celebrate you. We get to celebrate your goodness. We get to celebrate your faithfulness. We get to celebrate our trust and our provision from you, Father God. And I just want to pray for every single person that is watching right now, Father God, those that are low in faith, those that are struggling with their mental situation, those that are struggling with not being able to control the future. God, would you bring them peace and would you bring them calmness in the midst of this? Would you truly bring them calmness in the midst of the storm? Father God, and I just pray for those that are in our townships and I pray for those that don't necessarily have all the food and have all the provisions that are needed for this period of lockdown. Father God, would you provide for them miraculously, Father God. Father God, would you comfort them? God, in their tears, would you bring them joy? Father God, and would you provide their every health need and medical need in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. It's so important to pray during this time. Uh, because prayer brings us closer and brings us into a better intimacy with God. And I want to encourage you to keep on praying and keep on drawing near to God during this time. And what an appropriate theme I really do believe, because I believe that in the midst of us being locked down, God can do the greatest move He's ever done um, in the midst of this, in the midst of social distancing or physical distancing. I believe that God's Spirit is going to move in greater ways than what we've seen in this generation. And today we're talking about expanding the kingdom. And we've been walking through the parables of how Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to be talking about the wedding feast today. You know, some of us might not have had breakfast. Uh, I want to encourage you, maybe put this on pause and go, go grab some tea or grab some coffee and eat while we're having a feast together. Because this is going to be a message that is going to change our perspective and change what it means to be community and what it means to be invited and what it means to be embraced and what it means to be accepted. So we're going to be digging into the wedding feast. And if you think about the Jewish culture and what it meant to have a wedding feast back in biblical times, for a kingdom, for a king, the wedding feast, the wedding banquet was one of the most important events in the times of royalty in, in the royal period. And it spoke about new responsibility. It spoke about succession. It spoke about multiplication because 
marriage means babies, right? Um, it, it speaks about strengthening and alliances, and it speaks about celebration, and it speaks about honor. No corners are cut in this time. Every detail is elaborate, from the curtains to the chairs to what's covering the tables to the food. Everything is lavish in design. There's no shortage of supply, and every seat would be occupied. The people in attendance would be invited, not from just the city, but from far and wide, the existing alliances and the hopeful alliances. Every invitation would not be, would, wouldn't be spared. Invites were sent out in every single direction, and actually not attending would be an insult. And really what it was about was about honoring the king and celebrating the couple. So Jesus paints this incredible picture of what it means to be in the midst of a wedding feast. And he correlates it to the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew and Luke, they begin to bring a perspective into this. So I want to dig into Matthew. I want to dig into Luke right now because it comes from different angles. So let's go to Matthew 22 verse 1 to 14. And it says this. It says, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves. I need you to lock into that, that word. He sent his slaves to summon those who had been invited to the banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, the feast I have prepared for you is ready. My oxen and flattened, fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they were indifferent. And went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest seized his slaves, insolently mistreated them, and killed them. The king was furious. He sent his soldiers, and they put those murderers to death, and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but the ones who had been invited were not worthy. So go into the main streets and invite everyone uh, everyone you encounter to the wedding banquet. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the wedding guests, he saw a man there who was not wearing a wedding, uh, wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here with, without wedding clothes? But he had nothing to say. Then the king said to his attendants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. And then in Luke 14, verse 16 to 23, bear in mind, these are the same parables just from different authors, but from the same person, and that is Jesus. It says, but he said to him, this being the king, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field. I'm, uh, I've bought a field. I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded I have done, and still there is, there is more room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges, and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. What incredible passage of Scripture. And I want to lock into three different characters that are in these Scriptures and slowly break down what I feel God is saying during these passages. And I want to lock into the slaves right now. And I've got to admit that in my experience of slavery, especially in the context of what we've experienced in history throughout our continent, I, I don't have a, well, I haven't had a great context of what it means to be a slave. I've always related slavery to taking of ownership, taking of possessions, taking of land, and really looked at slavery from a victim mentality. But this isn't the type of slave that God was really communicating in this passage. 
Because in this passage, the slavery that he was talking about wasn't from a victim perspective, but it was speaking from a victory perspective. Because, see, in, in other parables, kings and owners send out not just slaves, but they send out their sons. They send out their sons to go and do tasks. And I really believe that there's a crossover between sons and slaves sometimes. Because I believe that in the midst of what we talk about slavery, slavery is often a surrendering of ownership un uh, unwillingly. It's a taking of ownership. But with us being Christians, being Jesus followers, being God believers, we don't have our ownership taken, but we freely and willingly give our lives ownership of our lives and direction of our lives back to God. We surrender those things back to Him. And I've got to believe that when we surrender ownership of our lives to God, we become slaves. But the Bible says that we don't become slaves in the lowest dignity form, but in the highest dignity possible, we become slaves. And why I say that is because when He sends out His slaves, those slaves are representation of His wealth, representation of his status, representation of his strength. So those slaves weren't adorned in torn clothes and, and broken belts and bad shoes, but they were clothed in the best of the best to represent the power and the might of the king that had sent them. And I've got to believe that because of the crossover of parables, we're not just slaves, but we're also sons. You see, so we gave ownership of our lives willingly to Him. And so I believe that when we give to Him, He gives back in return more lavishly than we could ever imagine. So I, wanna, I want you to change your perspective of what it means to be a slave of Christ, a servant of Christ. It isn't something that is taken away from you, but it's something that we've given back to God, right? In which He gives back more lavishly than we could ever imagine or dream in ways that we could never think. So the slaves here are a massively important, uh, important picture of what's really going on. And then I want us to th talk about the invited for the moment. Because there's two phases of invitations here. See, the king sends out the slaves, sends out the servants to go and remind people of their invitation. They've already been invited. These first phase of invitations, they've already been invited. But they give some interesting responses when the, when the king sends out the servant and says, hey, where you at? Things are ready. The party's starting. I haven't seen you yet. And they give some interesting responses. They say these things to the king. I have to get back to work. Can I get excused? I just received new stock that I need to reconcile. I can't be there. Bro, I, I just got married. Me and my wife. We need some quality time. Do any of those sound familiar to you? Now, I'm not saying that those things aren't important. I'm not saying that in the eyes of God, those things aren't important to Him. They are important. Work is important. Your marriage is important. But they don't supersede God. I know that when Megan and I got married, we got married in the presence of God and and we surrendered our marriage to him therefore we're accountable to him and we ask him to lead us in our marriage as a couple and as individuals and these first phase the uh, first phase of people in the parable they, they don't just represent people that are invited but I maybe want to think that they represent the religious the people that are educated the the, the people that have had experience about God the that have had a revelation of who he is. But in a certain part of the life, maybe possibly other priorities have begun to supersede God in their lives. And, and so when the invitation comes to attend the wedding feast, the wedding feast isn't that important anymore because they've positioned other things. They've positioned attendance within God's presence and uh, uh, attendance within God's uh, um, intimacy to be more important or less important than their work and I want us to think about that for a second see we've all received an invitation we've all received an invitation to his feast we've all received an invitation to the wedding banquet but we all have at one stage wanted to attend we were excited to attend but I feel like sometimes 
at some place in our life, maybe things have caught up to us and, and maybe things have gotten ahead of us. And I really believe that this parable is saying, hey, you're invited. I've got to say, you're invited into his presence. But then something interesting happens. Because God, the king, sees that these people aren't coming, sees that this initial phase of invitations aren't being responded to. And, and so he says, hey, go out far and wide. Go out to the streets, go into the city, go out far and wide and find whoever you encounter and invite them. It says, compel them to come. It's almost like a bit of a FOMO saying, you don't know what you're missing out if you don't come. You don't know what, have I, what I've prepared. You, you don't know what it looks like. You don't know the seat that I have prepared for you. So come on, experience what it means to be in my royal banquet. Experience what it means to celebrate and honor this couple. Because bear in mind, there's, there's no real selection process. It says that both good and evil, both good and bad were invited to come to the wedding. So it says, invite everyone to the banquet and give them a seat at my table. Seats where people with authority were previously meant to sit. See, there's a reflection on what it means to have an expansion mindset here. There is an expansion of his kingdom when the people of God are awake to the authority they have and are actively pursuing the seats where their God-given authority should reside. I, I, need you to make, I need to make you aware of this. That during our current situation, don't allow your present circumstances to cause your calling to fall asleep. See, these first phase of invitations uh, that I was talking about previously, I believe that they enjoyed the position, but I believe that they've forgotten their calling. I believe that they've forgotten the authority that they were given in the first place. And I believe that they've prioritized their own authority over that. So in the midst of this, I know things are hard. I know things are difficult. I know we have to do some things differently. But there's a key phrase in business, in the business realm, that people use when the environment has changed. And they call it pivoting. It means that you have to do something differently. It doesn't mean that your objective has changed. It doesn't mean that the goal has changed. It doesn't mean that the race has changed. It just means that you have to change your rhythm. It just means that you possibly have to change your routine. I, I love what we're doing as a global church right now that even though we're not able to gather physically, we want to gather in spirit and we want to gather in culture and we want to gather in language and we want to gather in vision because our dreams haven't changed. Our dreams as a church, our dreams uh, as a people, uh, our dreams as princes and princesses of God's kingdom, our dreams haven't changed. We're still there to pursue God's race. We're still there to pursue the nations and our city. It just means that we need to pivot in a different direction. It means that we need to have a presence in a different circumstance. And I believe that sometimes we, we, we don't know how to adjust to those things. But I believe that in the season, we're called to continue to expand his kingdom. But we're called to pivot and change our direction. I hope you understand me with that situation. But it's causing us to all do things differently. It's causing us to all think differently. It's, uh, I'm seeing WhatsApp groups and apartment blocks all of, a, all of a sudden sprout up. And all of a sudden, for the first time, an entire apartment block of 70 or 80 apartments are all getting to know each other via WhatsApp groups because they're all trying to care and make sure that everybody's all right. I believe that suburbs all of a sudden are getting in touch with each other and beginning to link arms and say, how can we take care of the people in our suburb? I, I believe that churches and communities are beginning to reach out and, and seeing what God can do and, and being generous in the midst of their lack. And I'm so excited about that. And God's beginning to change how I think about what it means to be His church. See, because... We're not part of the initial phase. We're not part of the first phase, but we're part of that second phase where God has sent out his servants and sent out his sons and sent out his slaves and said, go far and wide, go into the cities, go into the hedges, go into the highways and go and reach the good and the bad. I believe that in the season, us as Christians, us as people, us as believers, us as princes and princesses of his kingdom, we're meant to begin to take the seats of giants who have fallen asleep. So I want to step into the king. 
right now. And I'm going to flip back and forth, but there's a reason for that. I want to step into the king because Jesus doesn't talk much about the king in this parable. He doesn't reflect much on the attitude, but I know that Jesus knows who this king is. Because in Luke 14, it says this in a previous parable. It says, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you, Bearing in mind, the king has invited you to his banquet. When he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, he is the king. He is the king. He is the king that wants to promote you. He wants to promote people. There's a king that wants to lift you up in the midst of your circumstances, irrespective of your status or irrespective of your education. He is the king that qualifies you because there's a king that wants to raise you up and he wants to honor you. See how in the beginning we spoke about the banquet being about honoring the king and celebrating the couple. Well, guess what? Our king isn't a king that just wants honor, but he's a king that wants to honor you as well. He wants you to take, wants to take you from the lowest seat and raise you up into an elevated position, raise you up into a new place of authority, raise you up into a new place of exposure, and allow you to embrace a new authority and a new mindset, a new perspective. And this is what I realized about this king, my king. As much as I'm doing what I'm doing to honor him, as As much as I'm being a pastor because I want to honor him and I want to honor the gifts that he's given me. And I know that as much as you want to honor him and what you're doing in your workplace and what you're doing in the giftings that he's given you, he wants to honor you. But it just means coming into his banquet. It means coming into his presence. And the reason why I say that, it's not biblical. Uh, It's not that it's not biblical. It is biblical because in Matthew 20, verse 27 to 28, it says, And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Isn't that a mind-blowing thought in the context of this parable and the context of our situation and our scenario that when as much as we've come to serve him, as much as we've come to be bond slave and given ownership of our lives over to him, he's given his life to us, to serve us. The Bible says that when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, he said, I'm going to heaven to, replay, uh, to, to prepare a home for you, to prepare a household for you, to prepare a place for you. As we're sitting here, he's serving us. And that's the beautiful thing about this Waymaker song that we just sang. Waymaker, miracle uh, miracle worker, even though I can't see it, you're working. Even though I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop. He's continuously pursuing an attitude of service towards us. It's It's a beautiful thing. But I want to now dive into a section of scripture that we read earlier. And it's about the garment. It's about the garment of grace when when everybody came. I've got to believe that this invitation came as a surprise to a lot of the people. See, that first phase of people were prepared, but the second phase of people weren't. It came as a surprise to them, so they weren't necessarily ready with the appropriate clothing to to honor a wedding and to, to honor a couple. But certain theologians feel that when those invitations were sent out, the king actually prepared a place and prepared garments for people to wear that would sufficiently represent honoring the king and honoring the couple. So when they walked into the entrance of the kingdom, when they walked into the entrance of the the, the banquet, there were people ready to present new garments for those people to wear. And we might not think that we know what that garment is, but the Bible actually talks about what that garment is in in various passages. But I want to talk about the passage that comes from Revelation 19, verse 6 to 8. It says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the all-powerful reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. See that common theme of giving Him glory, giving glory, giving honor. 
Because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. She was permitted to be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen. And I want you to pay attention to this. It says, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. See, you and I are saints. You and I are his his saints. And the Bible in Revelations in the Hebrew or in the Greek translation says righteous deeds, but it uses the term doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. And it doesn't just talk about deeds, but it talks about a sentencing of acquittal. Now, that word acquittal means you have been released and redeemed of whatever you were sentenced for in the past. How beautiful is that? So the garment that is prepared, that that garment of grace that is handed to the servants or handed to the second phase of invites, that garment represents grace. Of irrespective of if they were good or bad, when you put on that garment, you are all viewed as the same. That garment represented protection. That, arm, that, that garment represented a cleansing. That garment represented a redemptive act. How beautiful is that? That in the midst of our wedding banquet, in the midst of our feast that we're in, God is wanting to promote us to a higher level. He's wanting to give us a, a seat that is more honorable, that has greater authority but the first step he says is that whatever you've done, you've forgiven for you, you've forgiven for because I've now put a new garment of grace over you. Because the sentencing that was given to us in the past is now God. And I believe, and this is the beautiful thing, that God had an expansive mindset in all of this. Because when he sent out that first phase, when When those initial rejections happened, he said, fine, I've got more than enough room. The passage actually actually says that when the servants came and they they, they provided the the, the second phase of attendance, they said there's more room to be filled. So the king sent out more. And what I realized is that this king's invitation is non-discriminate. It it has no direction. It has no parameters. it, It has no criteria Because when we put that garment of grace on, the only criteria is that they have now been redeemed and they have now been purified. And I want to say to you today that you, irrespective of what you've done, you are part of God's elaborate, expansive plan. And he's invited you to come in to his wedding banquet because you are part of it. He wants to honor you. And he wants to give you a higher seat. He, nothing's ever occurred to God. Nothing's ever surprised him. Who you are does not surprise him. He knows you. He knows your heart. He knows his dreams for you. He, he knows why he designed you in the first place. He knows why he named you. But all he wants, you to, well, wants to do is for you to come and say, yes, I want to be part of that banquet. And God, give me a new cloak. God, give me a new robe. Because God, I want to start over. God, I I want to be forgiven, so God, forgive me. So if if you're watching for the first time today, uh, I want you to realize that in the midst of whatever's going on, you have been forgiven because God has prepared a new robe for for you, a new garment. And all you need to do is this. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. God, I, I thank you for your life. God, I thank you for your sacrifice. That your son died on the cross for us. That your son bled for us. And because of that, we're able to wear a new robe. And we're able to start over again. So God, I give my life to you. God, I surrender and give ownership of my life to you. Because you are my way maker. You are my guide. You are my father. You are my king. So I surrender my life to you, God. And I thank you for the new robe that I wear. Now, help me to start over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's possibly the best decision that you've ever made for your life right now. To start over. And I believe that God is giving you you a new hope. And is giving you a new perspective. 
irrespective of where you are right now, he's given you a new hope and a new perspective because you are a son and a daughter of the King of Kings. So go out and expand his kingdom because you are now a son and a daughter and a slave to our incredible king, garnished in the most incredible clothing with his might and his authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everybody. What a great time of worship we had today. What a great word we had from Bruce. To be reminded of the invitation that we have as God's people. Invitation that he's there for everybody. But it's up to receive that invitation. And so I pray that if you took that opportunity today, may God bless you. And uh, because we are all invited, but not everybody responds to the invitation. God wants us to be with him. And I think that is so amazing. And Paul the Apostle also actually reminds us in Scripture. And he says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1 to 5, he says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and the extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Three quick things that come out of this as we get ready to give up our offerings, to be able to give up our tithes, is that there is a grace that God has given to the church. There is a grace that God gives to us as, as His followers and his, as His people to be able to face the trials, to be able to face the tribulations, to be able to face this incredible apocalyptic context in which we find ourselves. There is a grace that God gives us to be able to withstand it and to stand strong in this day. But out of this grace, there overflows. And we see that this Macedonian church, a very poor church, who had gone through severe trials and difficulties, out of their complex situation, out of their poverty, they rose up and a spirit of generosity arose. And that really is because of the fruit of the grace of God over our lives. And I know that we can all be generous, generous with our time, generous with our treasure, generous with our with our talents and it's it's a spirit that god i believe helps us to live by and then then it says they gave themselves first of all to the lord and that for me was the, i think the secret to this incredible this incredible grace of generosity is that they first surrendered everything they had everything that they were to christ they gave of themselves to god first it's kind of like when you lay it all down God gives us the capacity and the grace to pick things up, to be able to take things to a whole new level of life. Because at the end of, of verse 7, and because then Paul goes in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7, he says, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, he says, see that you excel in this grace of giving. And so what Paul is saying here is, we need to excel in so many areas of life. So it's not a, about priorities of, well, I first got to take care of my faith. I've got to take care of my speech and my knowledge. And I need to build my life in other ways. And, and then I'll focus on this need of giving. He is saying, no, we need to excel in all of life, but especially in this grace of giving. And as we, in this time, almost we'll, we'll feel like we need to shrink back and we need to hold back and, and, and pull back in fear. No, 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 there's a grace on your life today to step forward in faith, to step forward in hope, to step forward in love, and to believe that whatever God has given you, you can, you, you can excel beyond your own understanding because it's a spiritual dim dimension that we enter in. It's a spiritual conclusion, a spiritual outflow, and it's called the grace of giving. So as you give this morning, it's an act of grace. It's an act of mercy. And as you step forward, in your generosity. There are many different ways that you can give, and we're going to help you to do that even as you are watching online. Uh, you're able to give. You can give to us by putting an EFT into Life Church's account. Uh, you can e electronically transfer to our Life Church Standard Bank account in Seapoint. Uh, you can snap scan. Uh, you might have the capacity right now on an app to take your phone and snap scan right now and make an offering uh, to Life Church. And then, of course, you can go onto our Life Church app 
uh, our Life Church Africa app, and uh, there you'll find that there's a great opportunity for you to be able to give. So come on, let's let's this act of grace, this this grace of giving, this grace of generosity. Let's step forward today, just as we've heard that there's an invitation for us to be part of the kingdom. Let's expand the kingdom in Jesus' name as we give today. God bless you. So again, thank you for joining us here at Life Church. Thank you for being part of this moment of time in which we find ourselves. I am truly believing for your life and for the days that lie ahead. So look to God as you go through this week. Stay connected to us. Keep uh, with, uh, looking at our devotionals. Keep looking at what we're putting out there and uh, assimilate that into your life. Allow God to speak to you. So come on, let's, let's believe for the benediction this morning. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you continue to, to believe Him and to trust Him and to allow His grace to manifest in and through your life that the true riches of heaven will become perfectly visible in these days in which we find ourselves until Jesus comes to ultimately rule and reign with us for all eternity. Be strong and be courageous for the Lord your God will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you even until the end. God bless you.
night has fallen When fear is coming Still you're calling me When faith is lost and My hope exhausted You will be my strength When my mind says I'm not good enough God, you're enough for me Yeah, I've decided
Something about